In this video, we're going to look at how we can compute absorption frequencies in NMR spectra when first order perturbation theory isn't valid for the spin spin coupling between protons. So, the condition we had for having a first order spectrum where we could use first order perturbation theory was that the frequency of the spectrometer, nu naught, times the difference in the chemical shielding uh, constants, sigma 1 and sigma 2, for protons 1 and 2 that that value was much much greater than the coupling constant between them. So that would be the case like what we have up here where the difference between these two peaks which are the split peaks of a single proton the distance between those is it's 30 times greater to go between them than it is to go within the peaks here. So that would be something which satisfies this criterion that this this distance in between here, nu naught times sigma one minus sigma two, is is much much greater than j one two, which is the difference between these two peaks here, the coupling constant. And when it does meet that, that was called a first order spectrum. And when it doesn't meet it, it's going to be called a second order spectrum, which we're going to look at now. Okay, our Hamiltonian for our system is going to be same type of two proton Hamiltonian we've had before for NMR spectra minus magnetogy magnetogyric ratio of the of the hydrogen nucleus times default magnetic field B naught times one minus shielding constant for proton one sigma one times I Z one the Z component of the nuclear spin angular momentum operator for proton one plus the same thing for proton two one minus its shielding constant times its Z component of nuclear spin angular momentum operator and then plus the coupling between these two continuing on the next line H J one two over H bar squared times the correlation between their total angular momentum operators, I1, total nuclear spin angular momentum operators, I1 and I2. So the dot product of those these two operators gives you the correlation in those uh, directions between those magnetic moments, those magnetic dipoles, due to the spin of the nuclei. Okay, and in the previous videos, we would have just called this our reference Hamiltonian H0. We would have called this our perturbation H1. But we can't do that now because it's not really a perturbation because it's uh, it's very large, it's very small relative to the uh, di distance between these two peaks. So the perturbation actually isn't small. So we're going to define our four states here. Uh, we're going to have phi one. It's being spin up for proton one, spin up for proton two. We have phi two, which is equal to spin up proton one, spin down proton two. Phi three, spin down proton one, spin up proton two. Protons one and two here on our given molecule. And phi four, which is spin down for both of them. Okay, and those all have the energy levels by default, which we've defined in the previous videos on uh, these types of these types of spectra. And notice here that I've I've chosen this case such that I think the chemical shift of these two molecules is going to be very close to each other. They're each they're each adjacent to two uh, mildly electronegative atoms. They're each uh, two bond. They're each three bonds away from two more fairly uh, electronegative atoms. But this one has two bromines. This one has a bromine and an iodine, and the iodine is a little bit less electronegative than the bromine. So I think these are going to be different in chemical shift, but by a small amount such that they will be a second order spectrum. Okay, so as we said, this criterion isn't going to be met. So what we're going to do instead of perturbation theory is we're going to use the linear variational method. So that's where we define our wave function as a linear combination of these four states, where each of them has a coefficient between 0 and 1 times each, uh, each available state. These coefficients could be zero, they could be one, 
but the only limitation is that the sum of their squares is going to end up equaling 1, such that you have a normalized total wave function, just as we discussed on videos on the linear variational method. Then the energy of these states is going to be the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So psi star h, well, don't need the psi there, it's in a, in a, in a bra that indicates that it is psi star, and the ket indicates psi. So psi star h psi integral over them over the integral psi star psi. So the top being the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, because each of these are not necessarily eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, and then the denominator for normalization, just in case that's necessary. Okay, so we can define some various matrix elements, H, I, J, which are defined to be phi star I, H, phi J. Those define the matrix H. And then in the linear variational method, what we're solving is we have the matrix H minus E on the diagonals, the determinant of that equals zero. So we have to define a bunch of values for what these HIJ elements are going to be. And I'm not going to go through those all in kind of a lot of detail. I've gone through more detail of what these kinds of things look like in the previous videos on perturbation theory. But I'll just mention uh, some values here in passing. So I'll define the quantity D sub I where d sub i is equal to 1 half h nu naught, the spectrometer frequency, times 1 minus sigma i, the shielding constant of the given nucleus, uh, being either 1 or 2 in this case. So that's going to give us uh, some various values here. If you take our Hamiltonian, apply it to these various states, uh, get what the result is, and then, and then multiply on the left by the complex conjugate of these various states and do the integrals. Here's some of the results that you'll get for that. H11 minus D1 minus D2 plus HJ12 over 4. J12 being our coupling constant. And then you have <coughs> various uh, off diagonal elements, which are another diagonal element, H22. So minus D1 plus D2, that's going to be minus HJ12 over 4. I'm going to try to cram these in here so I can have the space over here to write the final values I want to write. H33, D1 minus D2 minus HJ14 over 4. Then there's two more I'm going to squeeze in. We're going to have H44, which is going to equal D1 plus D2 plus HJ12 over 4. So those are all the diagonal elements. That's just the Hamiltonian acting on each of these individual states here. So it's psi star 1 H psi. So that's really just the energy of each of these individual basis functions here. And then we have only one off diagonal element which ends up being zero, well two which are equal to each other, h23 which equals h32 which is just going to equal hj12 over two. So there's only one element here that ends up being coupled but it's uh, two and three end up having coupling to one another. So the energies of phi1 and phi4 those are going to remain the same, but we're going to get some we're going to get some strange business in terms of the coupling between psi two between phi two and phi three. So our final energy levels are going to end up coming out to being the following. So we're going to have E one equals minus h nu naught times one minus sigma one plus sigma two over two. That's the, the value of it without any coupling, plus the coupling, which gives us hj12 over 4. 
So that's unchanged. That's the same as it was in a first order spectrum. We have E4, which is also going to be the same. And this is going to be positive h nu naught times 1 minus sigma 1 plus sigma 2 over 2. That also gets shifted up due to the coupling hj12 over 4. Now here's where the magic happens, which is the result of second order spectra, which is where these second and third energy levels, these middle energy levels where one is spin up and one is spin down, here's where everything kind of goes a little bit haywire and gives us the kind of weird spectra we see below. We have E2, which is the second eigenvalue of this, of this Hamiltonian matrix here. That's going to be minus h over 2. Then we have big bracket here, nu naught squared, sigma 1 minus sigma 2 squared, plus j12 squared, and take that whole thing, take the square root, minus h j12 over 4. And for E3, we're going to have plus h over 2 nu naught squared sigma 1 minus sigma 2 squared plus j12 squared taken to the square root so this same kind of term we have there and that's also going to be minus hj12 over 4 so what this does here is you have this uh, nu naught times sigma 1 minus sigma 2 term and you have this j12 term so what happens is in the limit that nu naught times sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is much, much greater than j12, then this just becomes nu, nu squared sigma 1 minus sigma 2 squared square root. So in the limit of this, these peaks being way further apart than their coupling, then the, the second and third energy levels just become minus h over 2 nu naught times sigma 1 minus sigma 2, then minus hj12 over 4. So in the limit that, that this term is much, much greater than the coupling, this term kind of disappears, and it just goes to the square root of this part of it. And then in the limit that J12 gets closer, it, it contributes more and more, and it kind of messes up the peak structure, and we don't get these nice little doublets here that we like to see, which are equal in, kind of equal in magnitude and, and very nicely separated. So if you look at how this affects the kind of energy diagram we had in the first order spectra video, what we'll have is as your, as your separation between these gets smaller and smaller, you'll start having these peaks kind of having shoulders in towards each other where one peak will be larger than the other until when you get to very, very small differences, the, the outer peak becomes very, very small, the inner peak dominates, and then eventually they become uh, very, very close, such that you can't even tell that they are, in fact, a doublet. They look more like a kind of weird quartet. And then eventually, uh, when, when there's zero there, so at no coupling, it just merges back into one peak.